This is the Doc Psychology Podcast with Lynn Bokey, Todd Langston, and Art Ortiz. All right, welcome to the Doc Psychology Podcast with Lynn, Todd, and Art. And today we actually gonna, we're going to be answering a question that Lynn received. And so we think we're going to, we want to give you something tangible, the listeners to take home. Uh, also, we're going to be giving us, giving you guys our email address. So if you guys have any questions, feel free to email dogpsychologypodcast at gmail.com. Not the dog psychology podcast, but dogpsychologypodcast at gmail.com. All right, Lynn, let's go into the question. All right. This one comes from Aaron Faith and says, hi, Lynn, I have to take out my glasses. Hi, Lynn, I have a question for you. I have heard Caesar and several of you talk about how dogs live in the moment and how humans keep dogs in traumatic or difficult events by their reactions, which I do believe makes sense. But when you consider that the physical body can actually store trauma energy in different organs, do you believe the concept of dogs not living in the past is true 100%? of the time. My dad is a holistic health and practitioner, so I'm pretty familiar with the concept of energy, meridian flow, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think something in a dog's body can can be out of balance enough that instead of releasing the trauma, it becomes trapped in spite of the human's reactions? And in order to help the dog heal, You might need to implement something like acupuncture, massage, vibrational medicine, like homeopathy, flower essence, do to get the body to physically release so the dog can begin to process and let go, which they might not be able to do otherwise. So it is a good question. Uh, Let me just, because I I think you guys will have more on this, and I didn't say you were a moron. I said, I think you guys will have more on this than I have to offer. I, I'm not uh, versed in, in uh, the anatomy of a dog well enough to know anything about the functions of the organs. I have heard and read how it, uh, trauma can be stored in organs for humans. But what I hear is basically what we talk about as associations. And so whether it's stored in an organ or not, it's built up to an association, the trauma. And so it can be released through what we do through dog psychology, in my opinion, um, by uh, building a new association that overpowers or overshadows the one that's got the trauma. One more valuable is what I really should say. Uh, An association more valuable than the one that's causing the trauma. Now, I don't know anything about the meridians and and all of that. So I think you guys may have read up a little bit on it. So I'll let you go from there. But for me, all of that talk, just association, and it can be removed. I hope I'm not misunderstanding the question. You guys, uh, No, I, I don't think you're misunderstanding it. I, I think, um, you know, I think another term would be stuck, you know, yeah. where the dogs get stuck in a, in a, in a, in a pattern or a mindset. And mm-hmm a loop yeah i agree uh, association i also though believe that in a different variation the dog's holding in the body but what we naturally do is we focus so much on moving the dog and exercising the dog that i think we release it uh i i think i think it yes i think the body's holding a lot of not necessarily the trauma because to me what i i've always simply said all right a dog's brain is like a human brain minus consciousness so you're not really getting this, this, they're not holding on to something for um, some weird, obscure reason like a human can do. Yeah, um, because if you move out of the associated area, then it, the trauma it, or the behavior yeah. doesn't exist. So, and I did miss that. So for me, association it has goes all the way down to what I call a, a, a physical memory. And so right. the body acts as if the trauma is happening at this moment because they perceive it through association. But yeah, we move them out of that area. They don't tend to hold on to it so much. And if it's a nervous type, insecure type, that's just their position in the act, so to speak. It's not, I don't know that that has much to do with a trauma uh, can add to it. But, but I like where you were going with that, Todd. Well, if you've, if you've ever seen Angela do the sound bowls, what's mm-hmm. 
interesting is how for each person, the frequency hits it in the body in a different spot, wherever you're holding on to the issue, like whatever is part of your body is blocked, a different frequency hits it. And you'll hear people just break down in tears. It's like this thing gets in there and does some weird thing inside the body. And she says that she does it for the dogs. So mm-hmm. it would be cool to hear her point of view on something like this because, <clears throat> excuse me, she's actively used frequency to to change things. But yeah, I'm I'm a big believer of it's just an associative reaction that we have to rewire. I think I, another follow up to this would be after we hear from you, Art, would be what we've done to unstick dogs. You know, I think that will be some good stuff because that really is where these people will understand. Mm-hmm. the layers that we're seeing of this as less emotional, more mechanical. Yeah. So for me, the short answer is yes. A lot of stuff can be stored, but it still goes back to associations, right? And so I know that, uh, uh, you know, there's there's a book that was, it's called The Body Keeps Score. Um, and basically it's talking about, you know, it's a human, it's written for humans, but it's talking about how, uh, the tissue in the body keeps score, like it keeps it stored within um, the body. Now, uh, in my personal, like me, I've done some, I've done some what's called uh, fascia care, fascia therapy, which is basically a massage through the fascia to release anything that it, that is stored within the body. And so, you know, I do believe that the last of the, that the body can be stored. And like you were talking about, Todd, like, well, what can be done? And, you know, anytime we're working with a dog, whether, you know, you mentioned the exercise, exercise is one, but even the massage after, like, I think a lot of times people, when they see that, they think that we're actually um, affect, giving the dog affection, but we're not. Right. Matter of fact, matter of fact today, Anne was uh, with our dog, Gracie, um, in which I do want to talk about her too, by the way, because it, I have another take on the body storing it. Uh, Anne was just kind of came in and walked in the house and Anne was massaging her. This is a dog that that did not like be touched. And now she's opening up to the fact of being touched uh, by Anne um, so that to have that release because she's starting, Gracie the dog is starting to feel the effects of, she's feeling more confident about herself. And so she's starting to to trust more because she feels that she's being released. So the short answer to the question is, yes, I do believe that dogs can store it, but it is still associative. However, I have another take on it is that, I'm going to talk about Gracie again. Gracie was was uh, born, uh, I believe, in the shelter, um, and her her mom was also has a lot of the same traits as her as far as the nervousness, the skittishness, and things like that. But she had never been influenced by other human beings. She was mainly around just the, the her, and so when we talk about it being stored, I also believe that it can also be passed on. Right. Well, modeling, you know, there's you are there's a cool study. I I heard a study with fleas where if fleas are put in a jar, fleas can jump like three feet high. But if they're put in a jar, they'll they'll jump to the height of the jar lid. And if they have babies in the jar, the babies will jump to the height of the jar lid. Right. So it's almost like taught limitations, taught how you how do you want to see it? The the study was they so they jump to the top with the lid, or is it open? Uh, it's once, it, once you take the lid off, they'll only jump to that high. Okay, because they practice. Okay. Yeah, that's what they practice. So, yeah, to your point, I mean, behavior modeling is a huge part of all of this. You know, mm-hmm. so they, they, you know, there's something called mirror neurons, and and it's something in us that we will mimic the behavior of those, not necessarily the feeling, but you'll mimic like all the the physical behaviors and traits. And I actually looked up to see if dogs had them. And they said there was an assumption because everything social is kind of having to do this to, to, you know, properly live socially with other things. And so I think a lot of anxiety is at the, in some point is mirrored and, and, and then just reinforced. And we're back to what Lynn was saying. Then there's just the reinforced, reinforced association. There's just real quick on the storage. What I think gets stored in the body, whether it gets stored in the organs or not, I, 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 I couldn't say, but I do know that when a dog is tense, when it's anxious, when it's got these issues, these traumatic feelings, it's a lot of times because they're not being fulfilled throughout their day. And it's 
being stored cumulatively, you know, more and more tension, more and more nervousness because there's no outlet. So I used to use the analogy every day you get a certain amount of raw energy that's pure that needs to be utilized that day. And if you don't utilize it that day, the as soon as that pure energy touches what's left over, it's tainted just like the leftover. And so then that doesn't get used all the way. The next one goes in and now it's tainted again. So there's never a pure uh, flow of, of the physical energy that they need to train because we're not providing enough mental stimulation, physical stimulation, even social sometimes. There's just no, as soon as you give them, and we're going to talk about that, as soon as we provide them these things, that stuff goes out. But that's a lot of times you'll see me working with a dog that's been very aggressive toward me and you and you see me touching, mm -hmm. we're talking, and you watch, I find these spots. I don't mm -hmm. know what I'm doing, but it's just been instinctual for me. And I find these spots and for some reason my hand won't leave that spot. And then you watch the dog just melt and mm -hmm. I can time it with the way I talk. And I'm like, you like that, don't you? Well, why don't you just relax that right there and you'll see the body relax at that exact moment. Lynn, only... I had that video of Romeo when you touched him for the first time. Remember, you know, minutes before he was trying to bite your head off. And then we went out to the park and, and it was like, he was almost like, oh, thank you so much for bringing me out. Cause remember they were afraid to walk him. They had never taken him on a walk. And we were at that park and then he just kind of like leaned up to you and then, and you're like, oh, buddy, that feels good, doesn't it? And he was just like melting. It was really, I have that on video. Ah, it's a great one. It's a really great one. I love those moments. And that's when those moments like you're talking about, it is where I've touched some place that's stored, whether it's organs or muscle or uh, <clears throat> tendons, whatever it is, I get my hands on it and what I'm thinking about at the time and, and what the dog is doing. And, and it just kind of dissipates. And then you see this relaxation from it. It's not a necessarily even a massage. It's just a kink in a hose. And I just unwind the kink and then it flows through and it's, it is, it's sometimes it's magic. You see a dog that stands taller than me wanting to chew my face off. And then suddenly he's like, yeah, I, I like this. Um, but I, I'd, I'd love to know more if there is some other thing that, that I'm missing, you know, I'd love to know what it is, but I don't know about the organs, but did we get off track? No, not really. Okay. Have you guys but ever done? Puncture on a dog? Uh, yes. Dogs have been in, uh, you know, uh, serious pain and, and things. I've never done it. I've never taken a dog that didn't, was it prescribed, but they seem to get something out of it. It's very relaxing for them. And, you know, I've done acupuncture and I, you know, everybody says it's magic. I never really felt the magic that everybody else felt. I still tried it. I'd, I'd still do it if I, had a place that I trusted, but, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be really good for you. I've done it with a dog and, and myself, I, my own personal dog hero. He had, uh, some acupuncture, he had some, um, some low, like liver levels or something like camera, what it was, uh, and it, it improved. It really helped him out. I was kind of impressed with it. One of the, <laughs> we should bring, on, we should bring this per student of mine from Finland. She, uh, she, I don't know. <clears throat> doing dogs much anymore but she came to me uh way back in the day and what she does is like muscle and joint manipulation to get the body back like that was like her whole business and uh because she was in finland i could never get but you know like sometimes when your dog's running and they, they're kind of on their butt is kind of catching up to their shoulders that's not that those are signs of pain even you know uh a tail a certain way like she, she broke down long socks gate and she's like, all oh, this, it's like a, his tail is over one way, like a rudder trying to keep the boat straight mm -hmm. and way standing. So there's, they're so stoic. They don't tell you. And they're like me. I don't know I'm in pain until I just discovered that I'm no longer in pain. Oh, I, I, you know, I don't have any pain. I didn't realize I was in pain, but that's what they do. And I'd love to find someone like, we should have her on and discuss this. And then yeah, Brian on here, get yeah, Brian on here. Oh yeah. Yeah. That would be interesting. To... Brian Gruber. Well, who's that? He I... was the guy we talked about the last episode about, um, he does the body work, but he, he was talking about how 
um, how the way he got into all of this is called PKP kinesiology. Uh, and it was started in Belgium, I think he said. Uh, and he was talking about how he was having these problems with his back. He couldn't figure out why he was having these problems with his back. Um, and he had a business partner and he come to find out that, that the body was telling him that something is happening. You're, you're being backstabbed. And so he talked about how he had the software company and his, his partner basically stabbed him in the back, not physically, but figuratively. And that's why he started showing a lot of pain. And so he's like basically saying that the body will tell you when things are going wrong. And actually, uh, Lynn, you know, Cindy, you know, I mean, you remember Cindy here in Dallas, client oh, yes. of ours. Yeah. Yes. And so apparently she had some, I, I've had some rotator cuff issues. And so apparently she did too. And she was telling us that, uh, she was having some problems and so she went to the acupuncturist and, and mentioned, you know, like I've got this, this, you know, I'm here because of my rotator cuff. And, and he, t and he tells her that, ha that the, where, where it was in the body, I mean, the rotator cuff and how, where it's attached to, again, I don't know all the, all the logistics behind it, but. Uh, she said that that is the the pathway or, of grief, and so she was basically saying, asked her like, is there anything that you're grieving that you haven't grieved yet? And she's like, as a matter of fact, yes, my friend just passed away of cancer, um, and so then she just let it go. She just bawled and let it all out, and then started to feel better after that. Shoulders started to feel better. It's always nice when someone <laughs> sends your exact pain, point it out to you, poking you. It's almost uh, like someone being able to see through you, it's difficult to hold your emotions. It's a freedom that somebody saw and, and almost maybe feel exactly what you're feeling at this point of Cindy and opened up the floodgates for her and probably really felt great after that. But yeah, I don't know anything about him. It's not that kind of whatever where they tell you to put your hand out and they and they push down. No, it's not to the left. Is it to the right? No. Is it upstairs? And they jam your arm. Oh, it's upstairs. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Is that what he yeah. does? Okay. Yes and no. Okay. Cause I've, but I've, I've gone to those like back in like the early nineties and I'm like, you just jammed my arm down. Caesar posted a video on that yesterday. I, I don't oh, know. On that, like it was a video of a, a guy, uh, telling someone like what's something that you're afraid to do uh and she goes i'm afraid to swim in the ocean or something like that he goes okay so you're afraid to swim in the ocean so uh what i want you to do and he like does where her arm is out and and he says say it again i'm afraid to put, put i'm afraid to swim in the ocean and then her arm goes down while he pushes down and then he says okay now uh say i am i am i am confident that i can swim in the ocean and like her body like it like there's more resistance like she's stronger when when she says the words and things like that. So Caesar just posted a video on his stories yesterday about the same thing. Well, well I, don't, have, I was very <laughs> what, like, what, Todd? Well, you control it. Your mind, your, your body's going to do exactly what your mind tells it to do. Like the little, like a little subtle thing is if you want to throw something into something is where you put your eyes. Because your brain will do all the measurements and do all this stuff. Like it does, it has this a fantastic ability to take things to where you want it to go. I mean, all the way from, you know, action to thought like that. So I, I think. You know, crash. Don't look at the crash. Look at where you want to be and you'll end up back where you want to be. I'd love to see somebody that knows what they're doing with that to test it. But I tell you, I was very skeptical because uh, when they would push down hard, and then he would act like he pushed down hard. I'm like, that just doesn't Brian's, work for me. I think Brian's doing is, is is small elements of that, but I think I think it's pretty significantly different. Okay. Uh, and, yeah, he's not. You're you can you can do it without you, him touching you, but it's definitely the way that your body is is reacting and doing things based on what's being asked at the time. So that there's a constant response from your body based on the information uh i you know when i first started working with energy right shortly after i started working with dogs i had a lady when i moved to florida she uh she did all kinds of energy work and i was meditating she was had me in her house meditating and just completely chilled and relaxed and a dog started barking and i started coughing and, you know, we finished up with the meditation and I, and I tell her that I'm like, that was weird. She goes, no, no, you've talked about how much you don't like barking. She goes, it had to come out. 
because mm. it, it like it goes into the body and it has to come out. And then that particular moment, it, you know, I just uh, I release it through coughing. And I think this is what a lot of I did a post on it, a lot of allergies. You know, there's a lot of things that are that are medically considered one thing that are in reality. It's the way that the body's dealing with it. Mm-hmm. And so I think this is the consciousness of humans yeah. in some ways. And, and in other ways, it's just our our so yeah, it's, are it's like somebody with that. Those type of people found some sort of pattern uh, that worked and understood it that way. And that's a really great thing to understand that that hooks to here and that hooks to that. Uh, uh, I don't understand it. I'd love to have it explained to me by somebody who's really higher up there so that I can believe it. You know, Huberman. Yeah, well, Huberman's one. Uh, I actually, uh, Caesar texted me the other day. He asked me, he's like, hey, uh, can you give me Brian's number? So, Caesar absolutely is loving it. He's our, I mean, I don't know how many sessions he's had total. I've had two, um, but it was enough for Caesar to really enjoy it, you know, and, and Caesar's done a lot of work, meaning, you know, yeah. ayahuasca, things like that. So for him to really enjoy this uh, or, you know, Where find this? some, some, what? Where is this guy? Fort Lauderdale. Brian Gruber, BrianGruber.com. A little plug for Brian. Well, Brian's done a lot for me. The intention you mentioned earlier, Lynn, about uh, I just find the spot. I don't know what I'm looking for. I think uh, just the intention of touching for improvement. Your your intention behind that is what they're feeling, right? Massaging a dog is the the reason it's not affection to me is because it's a completely different intention. You know, if you go and get a massage from a masseuse, there's no affection there. At least there shouldn't be. Unless you paid extra, right? It's 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 a completely different. <laughs> Their their mindset is to release things from your muscles. And so you feel that. You can feel that there's nothing intimate beyond that in it. And I think people, I don't know if put enough energy into that or enough weight into that or thought into that when they're touching their dog. I mean, you guys tell me it's pretty much one dimensional. I see one speed of touching for the most part. Like petting, Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't seem to have an intention to it. There's not like, people don't know that you can you can communicate 10 different things with the way you're touching. You know, you can encourage something, discourage something, release something, uh, change the energy of something, stop something, all these different ways, just from the way that you put your hands on the dog and, and, and have your hands touching them. And I, well, I see more one speed to that. Yeah. I, uh, back in the day when I was like, I wish that there was somebody I could have learned it from, but I was just messing around with anything in touch. And I did so much of it that I'd, believe there were times I would touch just touch and I'd feel these sharp pains through my shoulder blades and I'm like holy fuck and I would I, but I I hadn't practiced that in so long uh so it's I'm not as you know sensitive to it as I as I was but I still will touch a dog and something will hold my my hand there on that spot until that's gone and it's not like I'm trying to rub it out it's just I sometimes I get on it and I and it's a mass area and I just hold my hand just hovering over there and all I'm doing is breathing. Mm-hmm. And then you see the dog start to melt and that spot either starts to get hot or it, it starts to uh, flake even, just that spot. And then the dog shakes it off and they're like, hey, hey, I like you. Uh, the dogs that want to kill me stop trying to kill me. Uh, for whatever reason, I don't know what it is, but um, I would, I'm curious to, to learn more. I remember a while ago, there used to be this woman, her name was Casey Cover. She had this thing called condition relaxation. And all, everyone was kind of into that when I first started, this was 12 years ago. Uh, Casey's now has uh, gone and retired. I remember Caesar wanted to bring her out to the ranch a long time ago when I first started. Um, and so Casey has this, um, uh, it's called condition relaxation. And I, I'm going to butcher it by what she actually does, but a lot of it is through massage. And I think there are people who do it today, but that's kind of like what we do. And, and I always, when I, anytime I touch a dog, and I always start with the spine. I kind of just work my way and I kind of just, I touch and I go along the spine and I wait for the, for the skin to go. It kind of bunches up. And once I see that, I'm like, that is, that's where they're holding a lot. So I'll kind of massage that area. And I start from the top again, work my way down. And then it doesn't do it at that point. And then I would start going further down the spine. And then I see it again. And I just massage that area right there. And I just work it, work it through. It works. You got, 
you guys know you feel the heat, right? You guys, when you guys get these anxious dogs and they feel warm. So I have oh, that yeah. times down at Monica's place and she took the temperature <laughs> and they're hot, a little over two degrees. So their bodies are physically heated up because they can't deal with or process or remove or release the energy in their body. So it inflames. Mm-hmm. I thought that. Uh, the- I was like, oh, yeah, to me, I, they have to be hot. And the fact that I'm at you know, a vet's office, I'm like, let's do it. And it was. And it has I to actually, be first. Sorry. No, go ahead. I was just saying, when I knew that, it's not hot initially. No, no. It's I'm saying the dog. heat that comes from my hand remaining above it. It's I something. Okay. Talking about when you ever get a dog, they come in and they're. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. They're, they're physically warm to the touch. And and I'm always like, dude, those dogs have to be carrying. They have to be hot. Like, they have to be almost feverish. Because they feel f- anyway. You know, their paws are sweating. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So much anxiety. If you think about the, the last time you got anxious, you get, like, a lot of blood flowing. Like, <laughs> while you're thinking about it, uh, you get hot. And if you walk around like that all day, oh, that, that can't be good for you. I think Cortisol. our subject of stuck, I, stuck in like the trauma, I actually think that is the trauma or the stuckness that happens the most in dog is anxiety. Yeah. I think that is the most stuck or traumatic loop a dog can't come out of is that where they can't, you ever, you can never see them come out of it. And I wonder how much of that is induced by other things. But to me, that's the behavior loop that the, is the most, um, would be with, in the body, organs, in, in the cells, and in all of that. I do the same thing with those dogs, too, but I, I take more time, and it's more challenging to see the effects, yeah. but you start seeing that the tongue recede even just a little bit. It's, it looks like a lot, you know? It, whether it's thumbed up like this, you'll start to see it flatten out, and then you'll start to see it flatten out, and then you'll start to see it going this way. And then you start to see it recede inside. That's when their their brain doesn't have to process the thing that's causing them the anxiety. So unsticking them requires a stationary posture. And the lower the body into the ground, the slower the respiratory system, the blood flow, everything slows down, the mind slows down. And so whether they're stationary standing, stationary sitting, or stationary laying down, being stationary will slow everything down. But when I keep them there and I'm not trying to force them there and I'm just focused on relaxing myself and, and, and everything, that's when you start to see the receding of the tongue and the breathing slows down. It's just a moment in time that you stop, they start going up again because they've had that, that time of it's been built up in them. So it's possible. To- and by the way, that's a really good point that you talked about how when you use touch to, so they relax, they get in a stationary posture or even laying down. Um, and I always see things like if I can get the dog to, uh, you know, sometimes we'll use like the, the pressure to have the dog. It, it gives a, a posture of sitting down and people say, oh, you want, you want the dog to sit down? He knows how to sit. I'm like, that's not what I want. Yeah. I don't. You're, phys- you're, you're seeing him sitting down, but that's not what I want. I want the dog to calm down. You're seeing the byproduct of him calming down. And then when you do, I'll kind of, I'll, you know, touch the body in a way. And then he just kind of leans. And once they lean, I'm applying that pressure, that physical pressure. And then they just lay down on their own. I don't say anything. I'm just, I'm, I'm guiding the dog to say, Hey, you can, you can relax here. You can do this. And people are like, Oh, well, he knows how to lay down. I'm like, no, I'm not asking him to lay down. I want him to feel good about laying down. That's conditioning. What you're doing, what, what we're talking about here, right. is instinctual, physical, psychological, even social at points. And, so how would and- you explain the difference I, to, you know, to, to somebody asking? So to me, it's a simple difference. Oh, no, well, they, you know, they're not going to communicate. You're not going to engage the ears in this moment, right? It, it, it has this whole other thing. They have a physical touch. So how would you explain why, Lynn, it's not conditioning? Because so like you just said, all right, somebody wants to go, well, just ask them to sit. And it's like, no, 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 this has to come through the way that we're, we have to touch each other for this. And, and it's- me, for me, you know, that was always the thing. He'll sit if you ask him. I'm like, right. okay, well, let's see. And he sits. That's cool. Now, can I go back to work, please? Because I'm not. <laughs> what I'm looking for is the resistance. I'm looking for the opposition, the mm-hmm. reflex. I'm 
looking for in between the opposition. I'm looking for that magnetic feel. I want to see, and depending on the dog's behavior, I'm not trying to force them to sit. I want to see if they are, uh, think I'm forcing them, how much they want to resist, how committed they are to their way of life, how, how uh, intense they're going to be. So I'm, I'm looking for a baseline that when I touch like that, you know, and I'm putting the butt down on the ground. It is what I, the first thing I generally put in the dogs that I work with, I call it the pressure box. And uh, when you see dogs that I work with and you're watching something else and the dog does sit, but it's, they sit down. It's not because they're sitting. It's because it's the first thing I taught them that they can communicate back with me. And if now I'm asking them to do something different, and they put their butt down in the middle of that, I am absolutely obligated to take at least a nanosecond break to, to be in the conversation, to let the dog know, thank you. I get it. You don't know what I want, but you're giving me the one thing I taught you. That is so small and so huge at the same time. It's, yep. it's you know what I mean? All right. I mean that what you just said, because how many times you see somebody get, overly fixated on thinking that this is about being right through and through and once you start off wanting one thing that's it and if you wanted this the dog sat down well no that's not right but opposed to going no no no, we we linked that together a little bit ago we want to make sure that that link stays there and we're we're that's so it's small how dog, it's it's how the dog can say hey look you're doing something in algebra there i i only learned this so this is what you taught me if yep. I don't allow that, imagine somebody teaches you how to talk and then punishes you for talking that way. Mm -hmm. So I don't care if I'm in the middle of something and they do something that I've taught them because I don't do tricks. I don't do obedience. I do pressure. I communicate through pressure. My dogs talk to me all the time through different forms of pressure. And the first one is always the best. You know, because that's the most solid. They learn quickly. If you watch that Chance video in, in Home Depot, he puts his butt down a couple of times, especially on the stairs. And you watch me immediately reduce and release all the pressure and move to him so he doesn't think that I want anything else. Thank you for being in the conversation. Now, hmm. let's extend that baseline. All right. So now it goes from baseline to common ground of understanding between all species it's universal these six uh, root forms of pressure universal so you just give them something it's like a code uh, morris code uh something that they can say I, I know that that makes him at least slow down or maybe i, I don't want here's a better one and i by the way i just want to point something out real quick lynn what you just said what like like todd said it was so small but that may go over so many people. So I encourage people to go back and listen to this, that little detail that Lynn just said, because that is a lot of what we do. That it's, little detail was so yeah. important and it's going to go over a lot of people's heads. I think, I hope not. Well, look at this. What we do as humans, we take a dog to rattlesnake deterrent class and you know, you're electrocuting, you're trying to electrocute the dog on certain things. And I don't mean electrocute like bad, but you do want them to feel this Avoid is it. This is so different than just your regular e-collar. That's uh, nose, eyes, ears. And they bring the, the dog up to the rattlesnake box that's covered. And the dog is all, and they wait until they're knee deep into it. And the guy that I saw, he was like the best uh, rattlesnake guy. In he's down, he's, on, he's got his hands on his knees and he's down there. He's looking for that right, perfect moment where the dog is not present. And all the dog is, is inside that box with his nose. Woo, woo, woo. And then they bring the dog back to the box. It doesn't want to go anywhere near, right? Rattlesnake avoidance training. So that's just the nose. Then yep. they finally bring the dog up to the box, but he won't look at it. He won't look at it because he doesn't want to put his nose down there, right? So they kick the box and you're, and he looks at it, right? So now we got the nose and the eyes. The ears. And then uh, the ears, the ears. Yeah. Uh, and uh, then what they do is they bring it out and now it's out of the box. So if they look at it, well, whack. And then they put the dog at the other end 
the other guys take the mouth of the snake shut and they kind of have it out so it's loose. And then they call the dog. And he's coming. If he comes right down the line, it's got to start all over. He didn't understand. Most of them, they go around. Mm -hmm. Now, here's my point. After spending the day with one of these people, if they're good, and nobody wants to see their dog in pain, but they have got, it's like getting a shot. You know, they got to get this pain. It'll be imprinted. Then they go on their hikes on a daily basis, and the dog uh, won't move forward, and then they start dragging them. How? The dog's maybe saying, hey, there's a rattlesnake over there. And we yank and pull and pull them through everything we just taught them. We don't listen to them anymore, right? So I think maybe even the rattlesnake people need to show when the dog is giving you a signal that there's a rattlesnake. They never think that uh, the dog's going to tell us that there's a rattlesnake. They just want the dog not to go to a rattlesnake when it's by itself. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. When you teach a dog that, and then you don't use that as a language. It, and by, oh. by the way, a lot of people who do that with, like people who use e-collars, and they're, let's say they're, they use it on dog reactivity, they uh -huh. only keep the dog in avoidance. They never allow the dog to go and accept the, what they're having issues with. And that's the big issue I, I see with people who use e-collar is that they keep the dog in avoidance. And so the client goes, oh, my God, my dog is not barking at other dogs, but the dog is in avoidance. The Dude, key part well, – training does the same thing they what? keep dogs, what the full-time therapy dogs they do the same thing they keep them in avoidance when they're training each other they're never allowed to interact with each other and until they training, bust off and well I, that's i'll get back to it sorry all right go ahead no it's no. the same thing but like you know the, if you want a dog to be social that's okay to be in avoidance as opposed to being going towards them it's okay to be in avoidance that's that's one step of the process then you have to get them into acceptance or to surrender, right? To be accepting of these things. And that's the key that most people miss. So when, when people, you know, a uh, client uh, sends their dog off to a board and train and they use the e-collar and they, they do that. Now the dog is stuck in avoidance and the client goes, oh my God, they're not barking. So they think, oh, it's a win, but it isn't a win because the dog is stuck in avoidance and that is not a good place. It's better, but it's not where they need to be. Well, right. they fight, you know, uh, my point then was that, um, I've worked with so many people that have done like hundreds of hours of training in these therapy type of programs and never let the dogs interact with each other. And then a dog gets close to them and they finally come up and sniff the butt. And these guys, you know, they're, they're, they're quick to pop. And it seems to be a, I don't want to say common in the sense that it's all the time, but it is, it is a common thing. A seeing eye dog? No, 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 no. Like a, 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 not a, a dog that is working for somebody. I don't consider the therapy dog necessarily because remember the therapy dog thing kind of took over. Everybody got a dog and said that they needed it for therapy. And, you know, they would take it to lots of training and the training would, was, was lots of avoidance of the situation. Like Art just said, obviously they wouldn't use e-collars for that, but well, that, that's what I was wondering. I was like, I've never heard of people using no, e but before. the same thing. And, because, yeah, yeah. And, and I end up, you know, you come in the back end of this and these dogs are biting because they've never figured out how to get the nose in the butt. And, you know, they've got enough confidence. They've been, you know, trained enough. It's this weird little balance. And like, bam. And the, the whole thing to acceptance is, again, that's a small but important thing to miss. You know, there's one thing to get a dog to stop. It's another thing to get a dog to accept. When you go to the real good, uh, like the seeing eye dog places where they spend a year or more with the dog and teaching them that, they do a similar thing with the, uh, they don't allow the dogs to play until the vests come off while the vest's on right you're perfect you take the vest off now you got your playful golden retriever that can go and do that's how they learn so we got dogs that get collar wise you know the e-collar i don't mm -hmm. have it on i can do what i want uh, at some point you know i don't even care if the dogs get collar wise and i don't have to use it at all if that were the case uh but for the the seeing eye dogs it's the same thing, collar-wise, but we take the vest off. Now I'm free. They just have been so consistent with how that works. You don't play while the vest is on. Vest off, play. The dogs can learn the difference between those two. And if, if the other ones, like you're talking about, Todd, are just teaching avoidance and never allowing them to interact at all, ever, then they're going to be tempted at some point, at a critical point of, you know, therapy and i'm going for it i'm gonna go play i don't know why they wouldn't let them 
play. That seems horrible. So, so what do you guys think about, I mean, we've kind of talked about like massage. What is something else that people can do when their dog is stuck? Oh, um, what? oh yeah. Tug. Yeah. Stuck, stuck in what? Well, we talk about like if a dog has an association with some sort of trauma, like we talked about from the original question, because, you know, they, the question was, uh, what about like acupuncture, aromatherapy, like things like that? What is, I mean, I know because I know all of you guys, I know lots, we just use the touch. That's something that we do to try to release that. But what are other, uh, things that people can do? I mean, like I said, I've, I've, I've taken my dog to do, um, uh, acupuncture. I saw some benefits to that. Um, what else is out there? You know, like physically speaking, sprinting, getting these dogs to have the ability to sprint. Uh, I, I always feel like, you know, I see psychology and pretty simple in this little chart and the ends, the intensity are the same, you know, so when you're getting dogs that are essentially stuck to me, they're both, you, you can, you can release a lot of energy through running, right? I do, to me, run, run slow, I fast, slow. Like, the, like you were talking earlier, not allowing movement. Well, you know, yeah, I want to let you, I'm going to let you run this out. We're going to get the, wow, wow, let's go, 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 go. And then we're going to practice not really moving. And then in that time, there's a massage. And this is where I'm pushing energy out. I'm, I'm physically releasing energy. Um, I think depending on what you're dealing with, I, let's say, you, uh, you know, the trauma, we ha you have a dog that's stuck in flight. I simplify what it is that I'm, I'm trying to look at so I can identify one topic that I think is relevant. So for example, getting a dog to move a couple of steps without feeling like they're pulling through the leash or moving, like predicting movement, like getting them to have to go into a, a, a if I, I'm, I'll call it a thinking mode as opposed to just a flight mode for even just one or two steps. Mm. And then, and then uh, expanding on that and i'm think i've got a case in my head i'm thinking of where they you know the dog shit itself and pissed on itself when they dropped it off it, it was stuck in flight if it got away the last time it got away it was gone for like 10 days they had to get a trapper type of thing you know it was one of those dogs mm -hmm. and i was really proud i got it off leash and it was just just that you can't move yourself mentality and and basically getting their brain to have to get into the game. You know, I use their negotiating skills. What do you want? You want to move? Okay, you'll be. I'll let you move. When will you be able to move? When you stop trying to move, right? Mm -hmm. So you got to figure that part out. You've got to be in this game enough to figure out how to flight. <laughs> and, I'll, and then I'll give that to you. I'll let you move closer to getting away, but you have to have enough skin in the game that your brain starts to let go of that that concrete. That's a way. I I'm careful when they're in the flight because I I don't want to have them feel trapped i'll limit them but i don't want them to feel trapped and then they go into a a fighting kind of flight i use i I'll use typically real long stuff i'm not trying to get them to walk with me it's not this it's not that part it's just trying to uh because Move. i go back to i feel like i have to also get them moving and I'll, a lot of times i'll take advantage of the flight because i have a golf cart and i have a big open area i'll be like you want to run let's go run let you feel like you can run and 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 then then I go back to square one, like what I was kind of saying is do it right then after the run, though. Oh right? yeah, I got yeah, all this space out there, so I'm like, well, all right, you can run, you can just run like a motherfucker, go. And by the way, I, I want to ask him is that Lynn uh, Todd because. Um, you know, if you have a dog that's anxious, they breathe a certain way, right? But even how you run is going to be important because what I've noticed is that I don't want to replicate that same breathing pattern, right? Yeah. So I run at a, at a, at a rate. So they take, so they're taking longer, deeper breaths because I, I have to change that breathing pattern because if you don't, then you, they stay stuck They'll they, because they're, they're used to breathing a certain, right? Yeah. So I have to run them in a way so they, so they, I'm, I'm guiding them to breathe longer. And so that when we're done, then we, that breathing pattern is longer. It's still fast, but it's long. Right. And, and then we could go and we end it by using the relaxation. I think that's an important key because a lot of times people are like, let me just put my dog on a treadmill, but they're, they have the same breathing pattern. So they're not really doing anything. They're physically, the, the they're creating a marathon runner, so to speak, right? And I think that's a, also a big, like, where people say, like, oh, well, you're, don't use a treadmill because uh, you're just going to create a marathon runner. Yes, but no. No, because they're all, you know? they, you're creating an athlete. No, they're already athletic. Uh, all those trainers that are saying, you know, don't run your dog, don't do that, because then you got to keep doing it. <laughs> they, they don't that, understand the process. They don't understand the how you end it. That's, that's a key. Well, 
to your point, but, too, one of the advantages I've seen because of where I live and having a golf cart that can go really fast is one of the keys to getting that natural pattern in play is there's a certain speed in which all dogs will leave whatever weird mindset they're in. And then it's just, it's the, the, the power of the running changes, the breathing changes the paw. You can see it. It goes from a, a flighty or anxious run. Yeah. You can see the difference between flight and run. And as soon as a dog can go and give it 110, give it everything they have, like you're not holding them back in any way. It, I get a lot, lot better result than just going out this- and running dog on a bike or running a dog with a skateboard getting them to <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. see it's perfect because this is what you're saying goes along with you know all my uh my philosophies but there's a positive physical stress and a negative physical stress a positive mental stress and a negative mental stress and so when we're taking them so fast that they can or they got them on the treadmill and they can barely keep up or you're dragging them on the bike that's negative physical mm-hmm. stress and it's not going to benefit so you'd be better off slowing down so we want to look at what each dog gives us and uh it's hard which whatever they're stuck with if i go running i'm coming back to focus on the stuck part and yeah. then the next time i work with them i'll work on the stuck part first and if it doesn't loosen up then i'll go run come back loosen it up so i'm really just oiling it up so that at some point i don't have to have the the run or the exercise and that can just remove this the stickiness and uh so just getting access to it right loosening the jar so a a tired dog is a a good dog uh you know they don't have i don't have anything else to think about but winding down well good let's focus on the sticky thing and and then you do it again and again until you don't have to have the run this is similar to what I, i i think i taught all my students of the day. If you got an, a, a reactive dog and you're afraid to take it out there, throw the ball in the backyard for 30 minutes until that dog is exhausted. Now start your walk. You don't have to go on 30 minutes. You can go 15 minutes. It's just teaching the dog how he, the dog's not going to say, you know what, mom, I know what you did. You threw the ball for me. You tricked me, got me real excited just so I'd follow you on the walk. No, that's not what they're going to think. They're calm or calmer on the walk and that's all they know and you're <laughs> leading the walk they don't say you threw the ball that's why i'm doing this so do that throw the ball walk them throw the ball half the time walk if it's too much to come back throw the ball then walk the idea is to have the walk in the way you want it to begin Cheat. i was about if to you- say that i was waiting i was waiting for you to be done so i could say that that's you- your quote he said, you want, to end it, you want to end it the way you want to be, you want to end it the way you want to begin. End everything the way you'd like it to begin. And so that's, you know, uh, that's that way it's higher likelihood that it'll start up that way. And, uh, but, but to the point of tired talk, I think people maybe use a different, let's use the word that we tend to lean into, which is recovery. So I saw something where somebody said a tired dog is just a tired dog, you know, where we say a tired dog is a good dog. And. And they're making fun of, and in a sense, I think that, but I, I see it, as you said, it's a recovery. It's a great way to get a dog to relax in a situation. So a lot of people out there who have a dog that hates a crate, have you ever had a dog recover in a crate where the water is, you know what I mean? And like when the best, most comfortable spot in a recovery is inside something like that, I mean, they choose it, you know, it's, it's, if you can put two things together the right way, this stuff isn't very difficult, but the, the emotion behind it and the the worry behind the exercise that's is, that's you know, what you need to go first is is the human worry concern and frustration levels and i was doing a a, a virtual consultation last night and uh the person had the dog for a few years and and i'm looking at her in the video and the that she showed and i'm like you're very frustrated oh yeah i was extremely frustrated i'm like well you would never allow a human to frustrate you that long. No way. But you still walk and go through the frustration with, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, good. So what is really happening is you're able to have a frustration that things aren't working well and still try to work through it. And what that does is it inconvenienced you for two years. Your dog, no matter what you're doing, is not even registering that you're doing anything. 
So we need to raise whatever you're doing up to the level of inconvenience your dog so that you he can be with you. So now you're not frustrated. You're inconveniencing your dog. You, you manually uh, place them in a posture, but they keep barking. Well, manually place them another way. They bark manually, move another way. Move, move until they're like, what? You know, now we move on. I did what you told me to do and it didn't work. Say again? I did what you told me to do and it didn't work. And that, that's what people will say. But then I, I'll see the video and I say, no, you're doing a version of what I told you to do. And, uh, and when I can have that on, on a video to show them, like, especially with this person last night, I'm like, yeah, you're doing the, the things that I asked you to do, but there's no purpose. You just, you know, it, there's no purpose of what you're doing, how you're doing it, why you're doing it. And now the dog's learned that you're going to put its butt on the ground and you start to move its body and it doesn't want to be moved because the thing is over there. So it just puts its butt down and then you let go. And so the dog's learned, I'll just put my butt down and make the human do a trick. So the idea is that, yes, I get that you put your butt down, but I need your butt over here now. Thank you. Same thing that I did with Chance. You put your butt down. I pause for a moment to say thank you. My response to that is, I need your butt over here. Thank you for being involved, but I just need you over here. And I'll place you there. I'll tell you this because I know Todd's got to go. When we're using the leash, this is my form number one. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But I always say the closer you are to the head with the leash, the more control you have over the body. The more control you have over the body, the more access you have to the mind. The more access you have to the mind, the more influence you can have over the mind. Once you have that, the less you have to do or say anything with the dog because you now have control of influencing the mind because we worked it through the body. And so I'll manually uh, place dogs. People go, but the dog's not doing anything wrong. I'm like, so what? I'm not. I got to go. Oh, no, we, I apologize. No, that's all right. That's okay. Um, but wrap, wrap it up. I, I just, I have to uh, cut out. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> See you. All right, guys. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have to continue this on another episode, maybe. But this was—I'm glad that we got to all the questions. We got a question answered again. This is the dog. So he really just left. Wow. He had, really had to go. He—he he had another appointment to do. But I want to say one more thing. Um, uh, you know, you're talking about your form number one. I haven't said that that in a long time. But I, when you were saying it, I was visualizing. I was hearing your voice say it. What you know, talk about form number one. Uh, there was another thing that I wanted to add real quick. Oh, because you said how. One of the things that you said was, was, you know, when you um, guide the dog and they relax and you said, thank you, I, that's really important. And I think that's also on me personally, the difference between um, what dog training is and what us from a, from a dog psychology perspective is I like to reward with gratitude because so many people, even people who've never had dogs before were like, well, aren't you going to tell me he's a good boy? I'm like, I, I did by thanking him. So for me, I personally like to reward with gratitude. So when a dog does something that I'm that pleases me, I say, thank you, because I believe gratitude has way more weight than use the excitement. So if someone comes, if someone were to say, Art, thank you so much, I really appreciate that. That has way more value than Art. That was amazing for me personally. No, no. It's been a yeah. the <laughs> This is true. But yes, but, thank you. Uh, I, it, you. When you watch it, you were still talking. Go ahead. No, that, that was it. That's all I wanted to add. When you hear me saying things like thank you or uh, any other words than good boy or yes, uh, it's because I want to feel how uh, what I'm saying. So I'm never going to feel good saying yes to a dog because it feels silly to me. So I want to feel good. I like that. That was nice. Thank you. That was so brave. You know how much courage it takes to do something like I know humans that won't do that. You know, I want, I want to feel good along with the dog, right? I don't need to get them excited to say, good boy. You mm. don't need to. Nobody needs to. Here's the easiest way. Everybody knows the dog sense fear. Well, that's not the, the, they weren't born with, oh, we got another fear sensor here. We got to toss it out. No, they sense a lot of things, many feelings, all the emotions, they sense it all. So uh, by 
by saying they only sense fear, or let's just say, take it, they sense fear. Okay, great. Then they can sense happiness or joy or comfort. Mm -hmm. And when you're walking- Or gratitude. Or gratitude. Well, I'm saying at this point, you don't even have to say anything. Just feeling good that your dog is walking with you, not barking, and, and you didn't have to do much. That little smile, that little perky smile that comes up on your face like this, that nobody else sees, the dog feels. So that is affection, but without touching. They can sense your joy, and they will mirror that. Just like when you're frustrated with your dog at its behavior, but the dog has no idea that you're frustrated at them. The only reason they react to these people is because that's when the most frustration comes out of my human. I'm reacting. So at some point, it's a, it's a which came first, egg or the chicken, right? It doesn't matter now. The dog is, as soon as you get frustrated, here comes somebody coming down the block. Boom, the dog is ready to go. If the mm -hmm. dog saw it before you and then you see the person, you get frustrated, which then reinforces why I got ahead of the behavior and reacted before you got frustrated. Because I know your frustration's coming. See, I told you, I'll kill him if you let the leash go. So chicken and egg, there's no, we both eat chickens and we both eat eggs. There's no debate as to which one came first when you're, when you're eating them. So when we're out there working with the dog, I'll let, you, I'll let you know what came first, by the way. In a second. Yeah, because yeah, I ordered a chicken and an egg from Amazon. I'll let you know what comes first. Okay. <laughs> we have an Amazon and one FedEx and see which one comes first. The, the idea is that I, I share affection with my dogs all day long without saying or touching mm -hmm. them. There are times that it's clear I'm sharing affection with them while I'm looking at them, and they, they get that little submissive wiggle. Uh, but you don't need to say anything. You can feel happy and they'll feel it too. It's their version because there's a, people only see one form of affection as the one version, but there are many ways of affection. There are many ways of loving a dog, which, you know what I mean? Because people are like, oh, you just got to give them love. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, you just feel love and that's enough. But there's many times the deeper you go into this type, and if you go even deeper down in with pressure, with me deeper through dog psychology there are times when i want to say good boy but i don't have to because the dog came up and put its head up against my knee for a second or it touched me with its nose thank you they thank you they touch you they check in with you and they you know i might have wanted to reach down to to hug kella then he takes his nose and rubs it along my my shin and that's it he gave me affection uh, that there's so much, if we just stop trying to just do it in a human way, there's such a finer wine, if you will, if you, you know, go in to how the dogs see things and feel things. And it's tough because people will say, I learned this, I learned that, and they're trying, but there's a deeper and deeper wow. way. And they're still just trying to do the human affection or the human thing. I just had Anita out here with one of the dog and I'm using the, the body without any command. And she's in her brain, she's still wanting to say the, the down or the sit. And I can see it in her, in her body. I'm like, nope, do it again. Until you can stop thinking that as a human and a command and you, and you walk away, I had to do the move thing with her, move. You know, uh, move, move from me. I am moving, moving backwards, staring at the dog, hoping the dog stays is not moving. <laughs> That's suspicious. Uh, but yeah, so uh, there's right. so more to dogs than what, what we've had access to, you know, anyway. All right. Well, we are at an hour. Let's go and wrap it up. And we are to toddlers <laughs> now because he had to run, do a, a he had, a, he had an appointment to get to. Uh, but Todd, when you listen back, uh, thank you. Lynn, yeah. thank you for your time. Thank and you. uh, this has been the Dog Psychology Podcast. Again, that email address is dogpsychologypodcast at gmail.com. 
We also can take uh, comments or questions on YouTube. You can listen to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and watch this, our beautiful faces on YouTube. You actually watch our beautiful faces on Spotify as well. Yeah, I saw all that the first time. I was like, what? That yeah. was pretty good. Awesome. Well, thanks, Lynn. I'll talk to you next week. Mm-hmm.